G'day guys, welcome to my photographic exhibition. Something I never thought I'd say. Come on inside. There's Sophie over here, who will be uh, fielding your questions, which I'll be answering later on at the end of the session. Look forward to those. Um, I guess we're here about this book. Um, it's a labour of love. It's something I've always wanted to do, was take photographs of India and the spirit of cricket to try and capture it through my lens. And it came to fruition uh, last January, so it was really fun to do. So I want to take you through some of my favourite photos, but I guess we'll start with uh, maybe why India is so special to me. Um, it gave me many lifelong memories as a player, but it gave me some life-changing moments. And one of those was meeting Mother Teresa on one of the tours. And I have a photo over here of um, meeting Mother Teresa back in the early 90s. And coincidentally, the photographer then was Trent Park, who happened to be the photographer I took on this trip with me. He's an amazing photographer. He's part of the Magnum Photo Agency in France, so a very elite group of photographers. I wanted to improve my photography. I've always been a, a guy that's taking photographs on the automatic setting and just taking thousands of photos and hope for the best. This trip, I wanted to take them on manual, so I wanted to understand aperture, ISO, shutter speeds, I wanted to know about light. So it was a crash course for 18 days. Trent Park did an amazing job and hopefully um, you'll enjoy the photographs that came from that trip. And one of my favourite photos is the one behind me here and that's a silhouette shot um, at sunset in a place called Juhu Beach in Mumbai. And I sat down in the sand, tried to get the right um, elevation, the right angle, changed the shutter speed, the aperture, tested many shots. And the good thing about digital cameras and Canon, amazing company in support of this um, project, you can see straight away what the shots are like. So there's plenty of dud shots, but I did get one good one. And this, this is the one here. And I managed to capture the guy in full flight at sunset on the beach. And the ball is in the frame as well. So it's not superimposed. That's actually the cricket ball they used. Uh, so I'm pretty proud of that shot, and the detail's quite amazing, and the colours. And that's what India's all about, trying to capture the colours. So let's go through, and we'll have a look at uh, some more of the shots. Um, this one here is um, a pretty amazing shot. This is uh, up in uh, the Himalayan mountains at D Durham Shala, and I had the Japan game of cricket with the monks. Obviously, I didn't take that shot because I'm in the batting. This is a Trent Park shot, but... Um, Playing cricket with these guys was a really surreal experience. They were so tough and committed. Like, this outfield here was very bumpy. And I thought they'd come in and they'd play with tennis balls, but no, they wanted to play with rock-hard cricket balls. So every second third ball, the ball would dive along the ground or it'd shoot up in the air, and there were guys getting hit on the, on the leg, the shin bones. And then one guy went for a cover drive up a good length ball and hit him straight in the cheekbone. I thought, that's going to be a broken cheek for sure. But he didn't even flinch and get on with the job. So eventually it was my turn to bat. I thought, I'm not going to have as much courage as these guys. But I did manage to hit one properly. And you can see the ball uh, flying through the air just above the mountains here. And all the monks sort of looking on and saying, that wasn't a bad shot. But pretty um, amazing couple of hours. You got cows there in the background. And it was just a really peaceful, serene setting. Uh, move along here to my favourite shot uh, for a number of reasons. Um, this was at an orphanage um, uh, where the kids were practicing their cricket and I wasn't allowed to show, shoot any of the individual faces by themselves. So for some reason that wasn't allowed. Yet I wanted to capture the speed of this young man. He was only 14 years old, about six foot two, had this incredible action, all arms and legs, but beautiful action. Capture him in motion, but the challenge was to do that, but not to show his face clearly. So then it was about um, you know, s slowing down the shutter speed just so it's nice and blurred, a bit like um, maybe an Olympic cyclist going around the track and you see the blur, but you see the, the cycle still, the, the bike still going around. So I think I've captured him in motion without showing his face and just giving him injustice. So for me, that was a favourite photo because it took me about two hours to get. I must admit, I took about four or 500 shots, but I knew instantaneously I, I, I got the shot. So for me, that was like a, a graduation as a photographer from a rookie um, stepping up one or two, uh, two classes. Um, again, amazing scenes, um, Juhu Beach at sunset. We're actually um, having afternoon tea on top of this um, motel on the, on the rooftop and look down and you could see all these uh, people on the beach, um, you know, running, walking, flying kites, playing cricket. Down further on there, there's probably 50 games of cricket, but I wanted to sort of try and feature this one with the sand and the waves coming in in the afternoon. So um, I think I've captured sort of the mood of the afternoon there. Then we go to another place like um, Jodhpur Fort, which was built in the 1400s. Um, a little game of cricket there. It was a bit like a coliseum. And again, the locals were really welcoming because I wanted to get the big picture shots. Trent had told me, 
get the big picture shot, and then he can go in and focus on some, some closer action. So often we'd have to go and knock on a door, a terraced house, and say, can we go up on the rooftop so we can get the shot? And again, that was the case here. It was sort of a three-story house, and they let us in the house, and we stood up on top of the rooftop terrace and got the shot. And I like that one because it's not about a great batting shot, but it's about action on the run out. The stumps have been taken here, potential run out. Um, you've got a fieldsman out, out here in the distance. Um, they're all over the place, and you know, it just shows... Um, you know, any place, anywhere you can get a game of cricket, but a, 14, a 15th century fort in the background. Um, and one of the concepts I had about this trip, after going to India many, many times on cricket tours and being on the team bus and looking at these great sites, I could never get out and take the shot. So I wanted to have a bus at our disposal this time where we could pull up on the side of the road. If we saw a game of cricket, we could jump out and, um, and capture that on film. And this is a perfect example here. We were driving along the expressway. I saw these guys out the corner of my having a game of cricket. And just this amazing tree as a backdrop. But what I really love about this photo is um, just making the most of the resources, you know, using the bricks as the stumps. Um, all the mates here watching, crouching down here, sitting down on the bricks, and the bowler bowling that ball. And this guy hit it for a massive six over the road. Um, so that was, um, you know, we stopped for about half an hour, got some shots. Then we made, I think, our, our way onto the Taj that afternoon. Uh, this shows um, how diverse cricket is in India. It can be played anywhere. And this is the, in the Ossian Desert in Rajasthan. And I don't think you can think of any more um, scene that represents India with the camels in the background, the kids here playing on the sand. And what I like about this shot is this young boy here is like, almost like a ballerina in motion trying to make his crease. Um, and that, for me, is a pretty special shot because it's, it's different and you'd only find that scene in a few countries, um, and most probably India is the place that you could, you could recognise that as being a game of cricket. Um, this one, again, was one of the uh, scenes where we just pulled up on the side of the road. We're on our way to the Taj Mahal, and we're going uh, from Delhi to uh, the Taj Mahal. This is a city called Gurgaon, which has only sprung up in the last 20 or 30 years. So this would have been flat countryside. All of a sudden, we've got this um, city just spring up behind it. But when we went past, I saw this cow walking in and out of the game, I thought, what a unique shot that is, you know, a cow in India with a game of cricket. But we were too slow, when we got out of the car, the cow had sort of moved off, and I thought, how can we get the cow back in the shot? And I know you're not supposed to manufacture some shots, but I thought, this is too good an opportunity. We'd left early in the morning, about 4.30, to get to the Taj, so the hotel had given us all these croissants and bread rolls and bakery items. And our security guard, I said, mate, can you just take a couple of those cakes and croissants and try and entice the cow back out to the middle, because I need to get him in the shot. So he took him out here, probably dropped the cakes around here. The cow had a nice little feed, then walked up back off out of shot and just framed it perfectly for me. So I thank that cow for being um, you know, very um, conducive to taking a shot, and he was uh, very helpful. So that's, um, again, a really unique Indian cricket shot. And down here sums up what cricket's all about in India. This is uh, opposite the Jim Carner Club uh, on a Sunday afternoon where Indians have the Sunday off, and it's a really special time to play the recreational activities, and here we have like six or seven games of cricket, all in a short space of um, confined space where, you know, and they, the, the fieldsmen from different games are in, in the road of the other games, but nothing bad seems to happen. No one seems to run into each other. It's like they've got sonar. They're almost like bats, and they move in and out, and you can see all the action. There's, there's a walkway between the fields, um, you know, and the people in the afternoon sell their um, you know, clothes and shoes and food. And here we have uh, just a person sitting underneath the tree, capturing all the action. So, um, as you see, it's serious cricket. They're in their whites, they're playing proper cricket, um, but obviously in a very confined space. Um, one of the most amazing days of this 18-day trip was going to this bat and ball factory in, in Meirut. Um, and this is, again, one of my favourite shots for a number of reasons, because it was the first time I used a macro lens, which zooms in and enables you to get a sharpness that you don't get from other lenses. That's the first time I've used it. And this was a, an older gentleman who was about 75 years of age, and his job was to hand-stitch the cricket balls. And they make eight balls a day like this, so it's very uh, meticulous work, and um, you've got a, an amazing eye, and precision's required. And you can just see his craftsmanship and um, the intricate detail. So for me, that's, that's one of my, my favourite shots of the trip. And below, that's probably the next step in the process where the balls have um, been lacquered up and they almost get um, incubated like eggs and they leave them there to dry under the, under the light and you can see the spray bottle here. Um, so they're like, um, you know, ready to be hatched almost. 
Uh, and these next lot of shots here are from the, from the same uh, place. It's about six stories where on each level um, you have uh, the, the bat shapers on one level, the ball makers, then the pads and the gloves. So each level, everyone has their job. And here's the first step in the process of the ball making, starting the stitching of the balls. You can see some bats in the background. Um, this again is um, the, the hand-stitched uh, uh, balls. And this guy was just amazing the way he was pulling the thread and the cord through the balls. And he knew exactly what he was doing. And the, the concentration was amazing. And he seemed to enjoy the fact that I was taking photos of him and he was, he was a star for the moment. So, and he deserved to be a star. Um, another part of the process is lacquering the balls. So they dip them in this um, lacquer and they come out looking like toffee apples. Um, unfortunately, we can't smell what it actually smells like, but it's these pretty um, intense fumes. And um, I'm not sure how the people um, manage to work in those conditions, but they seem to be happy enough and, and content doing their job. But for me, it was a bit overwhelming, the smell. Um, this is um, the bat handles that go into the bats. Uh, and this man here, it's obviously his turf, and he's looking after the inventory and making sure that everything's all OK. Um, and we go up here. This is where the, the bats are sort of made. So you've got uh, some bat makers here, there, there, there. They're making the bats. Then they give them to the guy in the middle, who then weighs them to make sure they're the correct weight, and he checks the balance and the shape. And if they're all good, he gives them to this guy here who takes them away and then they're off, off to sell and they get stick it up. But these are the bats that international players use. They're probably between 500 and 1,000 Australian dollars. Um, international players will use these bats and the English will have bats, so they're top quality bats. Um, further on down, have a sewing machine. Obviously, it's, uh, it's morning tea or afternoon tea time. They do long out work long hours and you can see uh, the fanaticism. Vera Kohli is the icon at the moment of Indian cricket. He's in the background, a poster, all their belongings for the day. And down the bottom here, we have um, one of the guys who actually shapes the bats as well, hand carves the bats. You can see the wood, wood shavings here. So that's a, a meticulous job and something that needs a high level of skill. And across from here, we have um, you know, a part of the process of checking the ball. So they're drawing on top of these sort of nails. And uh, this lady here took great care and looking at every ball, just making sure it was, was perfect and, and the lacquer had set the proper way. So... Um, I was really um, taken back by how professional and what a great job these people do. They don't get paid a lot. Um, and as a professional cricketer, sometimes we forget where the gear comes from. So this was a real good reality check to, um, to recognise that these people who do a fantastic job with only a, a small percentage of the wage of the actual professional players. So we've got to say thank you to all those people from those factories. Um, all Indians will know who this shot is. Um, it's the great Sachin Tendulkar. And uh, it's one of my favourite shots because it's, you don't see a photo of Sachin Tendulkar, you actually see Sachin the person. And I don't think I've ever seen Sachin so relaxed and so happy and without shoes on. I'm always used to seeing him with cricket whites and cricket shoes. I've never seen him without shoes and socks on. And um, it's, that's why it's one of my favourite photos. And the reason why I was photographing Sachin was because I wanted to capture India's oldest first-class cricketer, um, Vasant Raj who was celebrating his 100th birthday living in Mumbai. And Sachin's also from Mumbai, wanted to make it special, so I invited Sachin to come to Visant Raj's 100th birthday. And here's a man who saw India's first test match in 1933. 86 years later, he saw India beat Australia for the first time in Australia. So he'd seen everything involved in Indian cricket. Sadly, he passed away a couple of weeks after that shot. But there he is with the seven books that he authored. And another favourite cricketer of mine and a good mate of mine, Rahul Dravid, um, from Bangalore, he's known as the wall, he's got amazing defence, so I thought why not get a picture of him up against a wall, um, and he really enjoyed um, the fact that I was taking photographs of him, and he's one of my sort of uh, closest friends from opposition teams, and hi I highly respected the way he played the game, and his ethics, and, uh, and he was just as valuable to the Indian side as Sachin Tendulkar was. Um, go across here to a place called uh, Mathura, which is one of the India's seven holy cities, um, and we saw this game, amazing game of cricket unfold by the riverbank. And um, only in India would you find a situation where, I guess this is um, the place where people dump all their rubbish, but the kids found it um, a good enough space to have a game of cricket. And uh, if you sort of zoom in close, there's a dog there having a sleep there. You've got the batsman, the keeper. Uh, you've got a, a lady carrying the baby here. And you've got the boats out here. So the only problem with this venue was, obviously it's a bit uneven, but... If you hit a cover drive, the ball used to go, would go in the water, so they have to row the boat out to get the ball and throw it back. Um, so it took a lot of patience and commitment to play a game of cricket here. 
And this is a posse after the game, really keen to have a photo. And you can see the youthful exuberance and the life and you know, just their, their positive attitude um, to everything. They were just a really fun group of kids to be around. Um, from here, we can go over to an amazing place uh, called Dharam Shala, which is, um, uh, I get the Dalai Lama lives not far from here, but it's probably the most picturesque ground in the world. And this is a scene of the first women's cricket academy, uh, which I visited. I really enjoyed spending my time with these young girls. They're aspiring professional cricketers. It now can be a, um, a job for women in, in India. It's starting to grow in popularity and um, sponsorships. And they were just so thirsty for knowledge. I spent time with the captains and they lapped up every bit of information and guidance I gave them. And for me, that's very satisfying to, for people to take something on board and to, um, in, and to sort of impart the knowledge for them to sort of um, enable it to happen straight away. And there was a couple of examples of some bits and pieces I gave to them and they put them in a the plan straight away and it worked. And you could see how excited they were about it. And this is uh, the girls celebrating after the match, both teams together. You can see how much they love their cricket and what a background and what a place to play cricket. Um, almost a bit of Michael Jordan happening here. But they were, um, and down the bottom is um, you know, a classic, um, classic square drive from one of the girls, which shows the skill level of um, what they're doing. I was very impressed with, it, with their skill level. An amazing cricket ground. Um, Back to uh, in Mumbai where the, I guess the journey all started and, and where Sachin Tendulkar played some of his initial uh, games of cricket on these Maidans in, in Mumbai where there's thousands of crickets in a short space of, um, a short space of land. This was a shot that took me about half an hour to get. I wanted, really wanted to capture uh, the stumps flying out of the ground. Uh, but obviously the batsman didn't want to be a part of that. But thankfully he finally missed a ball and I love the way that the stump is uprooted from the turf, and you can see how dry the, dry the ground is with the dust flying up. You've got someone's shoe there who obviously uh, had left it there, and you can just see all the dust. There's not much green grass, but they still love playing cricket no matter the situation. Um, and here the, you can see the shortage of space in India. It just um, They put stumps in anywhere, and there's three games of cricket concurrently going next door to each other. I hope this guy doesn't play a hook shot because those guys might be in a bit of trouble. But um, it just seems to work somehow. The first night I was in um, India and in Mumbai, I just went for a casual stroll along the uh, Oval Maidan where Tendulkar played his first cricket. And down the far end of the Maidan, it was quite dark here, so that doesn't really give the picture how dark it was, was this young person practicing by themselves, hitting a ball off a cone. And I thought, no, oh, this person's really determined and patient and um, is, is, is doing the hard yards. So I went down there and, and to my surprise, it was actually a 20-year-old girl who was there practicing by herself hitting these balls off a cone. And I, I really enjoyed the fact that I could give, give her some expertise because she was trying to learn by herself but didn't quite know what to do. And once I gave her a couple of pointers about bending the front knee, you know, keeping the head nice and still and following through, she improved literally in five minutes and the smile on her face was, uh, was quite incredible. So she was really pleased with herself. So that was one of those nice moments where, to me, that's the spirit of cricket, someone trying to improve by themselves in doing all the extra time and for me if I can help them that was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, the trophies they play for every Sunday are quite amazing, they're the biggest trophies in the world um, and they are so keen to win those trophies and it's very competitive but what I saw was the games were always played in a really fair spirit and competitive and I love the fact that there was very little technology, not many people had phones or iPads, they were concentrating purely on playing, playing cricket and to me that's the very essence of the game and the very essence of sport is that you focus on that, your mates trying to achieve something together and not being distracted. Um, an important part of cricket is uh, repairing the bats and uh, while these guys are playing all their cricket here, uh, Madassa's father started this little bat uh, repair shop on the side of the ground 40 years ago and that's his, um, that's his son who's taken over the business. So all the bats that are damaged, broken handles, um, broken splices, he repairs them with his twine and his wood and his glue and his basic, basic tools and his craftsmanship and skills were quite amazing. I saw him churn out and repair about three or four bats in about an hour um, and he really loved what he was doing. So that's an example of someone making a living and making the most of the situation, which India does regularly. And this lady here, while she's down the bottom of this column, is very important because she's India's first ever female curator. Her name was Jacinta. She's from Bangalore. And she had a huge smile on her face um, and she was proud of the fact that she was 
India's first female curator. Um, we'll just move around uh, this corner and see what we've got here. Um, this was an incredible day, uh, spending time with the physically challenged cricketers. And uh, if anyone tells me they're disabled, they're wrong because these guys are enabled in every way. It was like pure artistry and, and, uh, and they were like flying ninja warriors through the air. Whilst they didn't, um, in some cases, they suffered from polio or missing a limb, they used these bamboo uh, poles as their balance. So when they flew through the air, they landed on the bamboo pole and then bowled over the top of that. And it was quite amazing to see them in action. It was just, um, I was in awe. And uh, the height they got off the, off the crease and off the ground was incredible. And again, up there, um, I wouldn't mind this guy's hair. He was, uh, he had some great hair on him, but he was um, a fantastic athlete. Um, you know, he batted, batted great. He bowled with um, good pace. And the intensity and the intent and the purpose... And the way they played the game was exactly the same as international professional, professional cricketers. Um, to me, they were just as good, just as committed. It didn't get the recognition. So I'm really proud that I've taken some photos to showcase what these guys can do. And that's another example down the bottom of um, you know, the strain and um, you know, the positions, unusual position they get into bowl the ball. And, but they just got it, went about their business and they were really good cricketers too. Uh, speaking of... Um, Cricketers that inspired me, um, spending some time with the, the blind cricketers in Bangalore was um, a, an incredible experience. I was totally out of my depth as a cricketer. I tried to bat as a blind person, put the glasses on. And the key is you've got to uh, rely on your other senses. Obviously, the, the sound, uh, intuition and gut feel. So you've got to work out how fast the ball is coming on the ground, work out which direction it is, and then get down low and try and sweep the ball. I hit two balls out of about 20. These guys hit every ball, so... As a blind cricketer, I'm a total failure. Um, and you got the girls playing um, together, and then the guy. This was um, one of the guys, uh, Bishwanath, uh, who plays for India, the Indian team. Um, he's in the B1 category, so he's totally blind. Um, and then there's another totally blind cricketer in the bottom. With, you can see the glasses on, and that's the shot they've got to play. The sweep shot is the shot that they can play because they listen to the ball, get down on the ground, and it gives them a better chance of hitting the ball. Yep, go along here to um, some sort of portrait scenes and some street scenes. I wanted to capture the people I met along the way. It was, um, you know, whilst it was about cricket, when I first went to India in 1986, I'd always get out on the streets and try and take some photos. So for me, the spirit of cricket means meeting the people and getting out on the streets, and I wanted to capture some of that on my trip as well. Uh, this is in Jodhpur, which is a really colourful place, and um, you see the, the amazing light in the afternoon, and the eyes on this young lady were something that sort of captivated me. I wanted to capture those as, and do it justice. Um, some young kids in the Ossian Desert just watching their game of cricket, and it's amazing when you take photographs. Sometimes the photos you don't think are going to be good photos turn out to be the best. And I only took one, one shot of this. It was like a, an afterthought, and then when I saw it back, I, I realised... Um, you know, what a great shot it was. The Dar of Islam, you know, um, one of the toughest places to live in the world and the biggest slum in Asia. Yet this man who pulls a cart every day, probably always 15 hours a day, just put food on the table, was very welcoming and put on this huge smile when I turned the camera in his direction. Um, it just shows the spirit of life over there that you don't have to have money to be happy. I'm sure it's a tough life, but for him to give me uh, 30 seconds of his time, I really appreciated that. Some more street scenes in Jodhpur, and I love the colours there. The buildings, they're like, um, like movie sets, like pastel shades. Um, so that was a moment captured in time. Again, it was like, do you mind me taking a photo? And you might say a couple of words in Hindi and all of a sudden it's okay. Like, Danya Vad was thank you. Uh, this is a grand, grandfather and his son with um, three goats. I don't know where you can see the three goats there. See how good your camera work is. There's one, two, and there might be a little one there as well. And this one here was one of my favourite shots, um, just walking down the street. And during the morning, there's always people having coffee and having a, having a chat. And this was the guys having their morning coffee break. And this gentleman here turned around and just um, the camera loved him. He just stood out. And I think he knew he was a, a pretty good subject as well. This is in the Doby Gap, which is the washing sheds in Mumbai, an amazing place where everyone has their role and their job. And this guy is the ironing man, but it's a, it's a coal-burning iron, so the coals in here are heated up. They get put in the iron, he closes it up and uses the heat to iron, to iron the shirts and all the clothing. And it was pretty hot in there. It was about 100 degrees. 
Um, some more shots here. This is a really interesting story here. This is a, uh, the palace of Bar at Baroda. And by coincidence, I didn't realise, but back in 1986, on my first tour to India, the Australian cricket team played a, ground, play, played a game at, in the palace grounds. And here I was 34 years ago, and it all came back to me. I remembered exactly how many runs I scored. I scored 86. I was given out bad pad when it wasn't out, so I was 14 short of my century, so I was pretty dirty. Um, and here I was, uh, all those years later, visiting the palace and meeting the only Maharaja and family who live in the palace in India. And he's had a long name, but he said, call me Sam. And the funny thing about this was, um, I didn't think we were going to get any cricket shots. the last time you played a game of cricket in the palace. And he said, oh, when I was about 15 years old, I said, well, let's, why not have a game of cricket now? And he said, good idea. So he got a bat and a ball, went to the main, main room in the palace. That's his grandfather on the wall. He was basically responsible for getting cricket up in the state. There was some Ming vases on either side, um, a chandelier. There was ornate paintings all around the place. And then we had a game of cricket, and he loved it. His wife was a bit nervous, I must admit, when the balls were bouncing off the, off the photos and vases. But that was um, a life experience I never expected, to uh, play some cricket uh, with the Maharaja in his palace. And those sort of things happen in India, just to expect the unexpected. Um, another street scene, pulling up on the side of the road, capturing um, kids just playing in a confined space. But you can see here that he's desperate to get in the crease, and they're keen to get the run out. So it's always competitive, no matter where you are. Again, some kids, we just pull up along the, uh, the side of the road and the, the, the gang of kids or the posse of kids, you know, all happy and content and smiling. Plastic bat, a crate for stumps, all wearing thongs. Um, but they wanted to play a game of cricket and they were so good at it as well. So this is me peeking in from the side when I first spotted it from the, from the road, um, looking through the fence. Um, you can see in India, you can have a game of cricket anywhere. And this one in the book um, I call Dueling Drives because there's a, a, rich, a little motorbike here and this, this, so they're both driving at the same time. Um, but that's India. You, wherever you've got a space um, and you've got the wheel, you can have a game of cricket. And some of the young boys from the orphanage, um, I gave them a bit of a drill, a batting drill about front foot defence and front foot attack and straight away... Uh, they enacted what I told them. So they're very quick learners and got an insatiable appetite for knowledge. And this pretty much sums up to me what India is about at the moment. You know, India rising. It just seems like the youth have got a different attitude. They want um, opportunities. They want to be the best they can be. And particularly for young girls, um, I think that is pretty appropriate for what's happening in India. Right now she's on the way to school and kids always take great pride no matter how much money they've got in India, whether they're from poor backgrounds, but they always have the perfect uniform on and, uh, and dress themselves up nicely to go to school. Um, we'll just move around to this corner here. And uh, yeah, we're back to, to the monks. Um, again, that was some... Um, I spent a couple of hours there just um, taking it all in. And um, yeah, Trent Park, who was alongside me, I thought it was an amazing scene. But Trent had a different eye for things. So I'd look at that shot and go, yeah, that's a great shot. And I wanted the shadow out of the shot. But he goes, no, no, don't. Don't take the shadow out of the shot. Um, if you look at it, it mimics the same shape of the mountain. So it was a total learning experience the whole time. For me, I didn't see that, but Trent pointed, pointed out, and straight away I said, you're right, it does look the same shape. So, and you've got the cows there and got the nice action, all the fielders. It was just a really peaceful, peaceful setting where you just felt nice and relaxed. I can understand um, you know, the monks, how relaxed and, and casual they were, but at the same time they were so tough copying balls on the body and not showing any pain or, or emotion. Far tougher than me. And this was a young man who had a beautiful action. We, we gave them some, some tips and again, straight away, um, they're putting into, into, ac into action exactly what we tried to tell them. Get nice and high, side on, front arm up high and follow through. And I guess this book here, this is a cover shot of the, the book, um, is the Taj. Going in, you've got to get a shot of the Taj. But Whilst this might seem like a pretty simple task, this photo actually took 18 hours when I think back on it because we drove from Delhi to get to the Taj. Uh, early one morning, a five-hour trip, dodging through the traffic like um, you're on a, you know, motor in the, like a NASCAR race. Five hours to get there, the Taj is totally fogged in. We waited a couple of hours, didn't lift, so we had to drive back to the hotel, so a 10-hour drive. Got some shots on the, on the way back, which you've seen on the, on the freeway, but... Um, I thought, I can't go to India and not have a shot of the Taj. So I had to get back up early next morning, about 2.30 in the morning, another four and a half hour trip to the Taj. And there it was. It was just perfect. It was like uh, the light was amazing. 
and it almost looks like it's been superimposed in the shot. And obviously the game's a cricket, and there's another game of cricket here in the background. It was just beautiful and relaxing, and um, I took hundreds of shots, and the Taj is something I've seen two or three, three or four times now, and it's, it's one of the best, most amazing man-made structures in the world. So that is the cover of the book, which you can get through stevewar.com.au. Um, but that's, that's a shot I really wanted. When I had this concept of the book, I had to get a shot of the Taj. Um, here in Calcutta, Eden Gardens, one of my favourite grounds. Um, I consider that the, the Lords of the Subcontinent. It's a place where um, we won, as the Australian team, the 1987 World Cup. Uh, some great memories there. Um, I scored a test century there. It's the start of the place where I, I guess, started my philanthropic pursuit with uh, Udayan. So um, I've had support of that orphanage for a number of years. So Calcutta, to me, was like a second home. And to score a century there, to win the World Cup, we also lost an amazing test match there where Rahul Dravid and VVS Laxman batted the whole day after I enforced the follow-on. Um, so I made those guys famous and I guess made myself famous as a captain, but still it's got amazing memories. And here we have the kids on the outside of the ground practicing and aspiring to get inside the ground, which is a 100,000-seat stadium. And if you're panning close enough, you'll probably see me on the outside holding the 1999 World Cup which is on the outside of the stadium in Calcutta, which I didn't expect to see, but it was a bonus when I turned up. Um, this shows the fanaticism of the fans in India. A guy called Sugamar dresses up every match for India in the um, Indian outfit with the Virat on the front. So Virat Kohli is his hero, and he gets, takes about two hours to paint himself up in the Indian colours. And, uh, and that was him getting ready for uh, the One Day International versus Australia which coincidentally Australia won by 10 wickets. Um, so it was a pretty good day for Australia. So he wasn't doing much celebrating that day, but it was good to see the work he puts into it. Um, some street scenes in uh, Calcutta, and this is towards the, the back end of the journey. And this was when I started to understand the, the power of light, which light captures attitude and mood. It creates emotion and, uh, and it connects the person who's looking at the photo. It just um, it gives them a bit of insight into, into what's going on at the time. So for me, these are some of my favourite shots. A young boy in the alleyway in Calcutta um, on the way to a game of cricket. Um, the husband and the wife um, pressing the sugar cane, selling that as, as juice. And the cat in the, in the foreground there. Amazing colours with the religious statues in the background. Um, some guys washing themselves on the, on the, the side of the street with the water coming out. Um, and a young boy here, the Dobie Gat. Uh, which um, he works about f 12 hours a day, he gets $6 US a day. But yet he had this amazing smile on his face and was really happy to pose. So his job is to basically to bash the clothes and to wash them and to hang them up. And so it's, it's hard labour. And uh, of course you couldn't go uh, to India without getting a shot of the fans. And this was at a Ranji Trophy game. I went down and said, can I have a photo guys? And all of a sudden they swarmed to the fans and they were so keen to get in the photo you can see the big smile. So they were happy to be in the photo. And um, around the next corner here, we've got two young, amazing cricketers. Um, the power of social media these days is pretty incredible. We found this young boy, Shahid, a three-year-old, and he's got his own Instagram site. And so we decided to go to his place in Calcutta. And we met his dad about 500 metres from his house, and he directed us through the alleyways and laneways to get to his terraced house. And this is his bedroom. Um, here he is practicing his cover drive on his bed with a little shot of the Caribbean here. Maybe that's dreaming of one day getting to the Caribbean, but he had this beautiful cover drive. And um, initially when he first came, he's, uh, he had a brand new pair of soccer boots on because his mum and dad wanted to sort of impress us because he normally wears no shoes, but they had a pair of soccer boots on. And you can see he got rid of the boots pretty quick and got back into the normal, normal way of playing without his shoes on. And that's him on his rooftop, his dad had... Uh, created this rooftop terrace with a net so he, he could keep the balls in check and he had this shot he was practicing with this one-handed cover drive which one day he maybe will be famous um, and above this we got Shyam an eight-year-old boy who practices 30 hours a week and has been uh, identified perhaps as the next Coley it's probably a burden too much for a young kid but when I was with him he was so keen and um, and listened to every bit of advice I got him and I love the fact that his eyes was so determined, he had the passion and determination, and that's what I wanted to try and capture in that shot was his, his inner strength and his desire to, to be, be the best he can be, even at the age of eight. So potentially he's um, going to be a really good cricketer, but 
I fear in some ways that uh, he's probably got too much pressure on him as an eight-year-old, but having said that, he seemed to enjoy his practice. Um, and to me, we'll finish up with a couple of shots here, which to me sums up the whole book, The Spirit of Cricket. I was trying to find out why is cricket a religion in India um, and what makes everybody love cricket so much. And I think it's the fact that when you play cricket, everyone's equal. It doesn't matter which background you come from, which gender you are, you know, which race, how much money you got. When you've got a bat or a ball in hand, everyone is equal. And I love getting uh, amongst the kids and playing cricket and you see some in the Darby slums here uh, with all the people watching on and you see the smiles on their faces. The kids on the streets are in, in, outside of Calcutta. And all the kids down the bottom with a, a group shot. Um, that was outside the, the, the Maharaja's Palace in Baroda. You can see the smiles on their faces and how much they uh, love loved being there. I love being amongst them because uh, you could feel their, their spirit and their energy and their enthusiasm and their imagination. And that's what, to me, that's what sums up uh, cricket to me, the spirit of cricket. So that's a bit about the exhibition. Uh, obviously, all those photos uh, come in this book over here, which is um, the Spirit of Cricket, Steve Waugh book, which you can order on stevewaugh.com.au. But I think it's now it's uh, time to probably go through uh, some questions. Sophie, have you got some questions? I can, from all the... Okay, okay so we've got some questions, so I will might read these questions out and give you some answers the best I can. So the first one is from uh, Ruth Mapleback. How did cricket get its name? Well, I've got to tell you, I, I knew this question was coming, so I had to Google because I had no idea where cricket got its name from. But it, it's actually a Dutch word, and it comes from the meaning, Dutch word for hockey stick. So that's, that's the meaning of cricket. Cricket is a hockey stick in Dutch. Uh, I don't know why, but that's the answer to that question. Uh, another one here from Chinapa Raju. How can a player from current generations develop such a grit and determination like you to succeed in the game? Well, I think for me it was just about wanting to be the best I could possibly be, not letting my teammates down, but trying to fulfil my own potential and trying to improve each and every time I went to practice or every game I played. So it's about not letting yourself down, about looking in the mirror, about being honest with yourself and, uh, and practising. I think um, I learned to practise the same way that I was going to play in a game, which then made it easier in pressure situations. So you've got to do the hard work, you've got to lay the foundation, but at the same time, you've got to enjoy what you're doing. So if you're not enjoying playing cricket, then it's very hard to get that grit and determination in your game. A uh, question here from Afsar Alam. In the 80s, when many English, Aussie and New Zealand players didn't take very kindly to touring India, what fascinated you about India? You embraced India and tried to understand the culture and its people. Why? Well, I think from my point of view, I was just fascinated by what was unfolding in front of me. I'm inquisitive and curious by nature. I always took a camera on tour with me. Um, and, uh, and all of a sudden, I think when you go out and meet the people, and it doesn't become as intimidating when you play the cricket. Sometimes um, in foreign countries like that, you get a bit of a siege mentality. You think it's going to be too tough. The food's going to be no good. I'm going to get sick. The crowd's against me. All of a sudden, you imagine it to be tougher than what it was. So for me, it was about trying to break down those barriers go out and meet the people, and all of a sudden you realise they were just as passionate because they wanted their team to win, so it was as simple as that. A uh, question here from uh, Clayton Angel. Uh, is there an incident, altercation, or interaction you have had that, given your time over again, you would handle differently? Um, I guess there probably was, but in my mind, they're all um, experiences that make you better. So good or bad, they, they make you the person you are today, but... There's probably one that I wouldn't recommend, and that was um, firing up or getting Curtly Ambrose angry and having a few words to Curtly, who at the time was the greatest fast bowler on the planet, one of the best players I played against. But to get him agitated probably wasn't a smart move. Even though I got 63 not out and he got five wickets, I wouldn't be doing that again because he was a great bowler, and that was something I probably shouldn't have done. A uh, question from Hamant Shukla. What is the one basic thread by which Australian sportsmen are so consistently competitive. I just think it's the way we're brought up. Um, I remember playing in the backyard of my house in Sydney in the western suburbs, one of four brothers. It was very competitive. We played hard but fair. We wanted to win. We wanted to get better. And that's just the way it was. And it was the same at school. Um, we had really good coaches. Um, it's just in our nature. We play sport 24-7. And you want to try and be the best you can be. So it's just something that's almost inbred, inborn to all Australians. Uh, question from Gary Romeo. 
If you had to pick a favourite photograph that sums up the adventures in this amazing compilation, um, which one would it be and why? I think I'll go back to the book again quickly. And um, this one here is, um, I think, my favourite because it sums up India. It's, it's cricket, it's the Tars, it's an iconic um, place and it just, to me, says uh, cricket in India. So that would be my favourite. Put that down. Um, Alicia Smith. Do you plan on photographing and making a series of these books? I'd love to see the different perspectives from India to South Africa to Bangladesh to England. Yeah, the idea is to, um, to definitely do more of these books. Uh, the Spirit of Cricket India, I think, was an obvious choice for the first one because it really is the spiritual home of cricket and, um, to me, is, is what cricket's all about. But I would love to capture the Spirit of Cricket Australia, the Spirit of Cricket the UK, the Caribbean, and uh, other countries maybe like Bhutan, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. So that's the idea and concept. Of course, it needs a lot of preparation, a lot of planning, and a lot of funding. And I was very fortunate that Canon uh, supported this project. And hopefully we can work again together in the future. Uh, Raju Devendram. Apart from playing in Australia, which other country do you feel at home and why? Uh, for me... It was always about going to England because we had the tradition of history, Australia versus England in the Ashes. I love going on the Ashes tours. Um, the history and tradition of the game, playing at Lords was the ultimate for any cricketer. That was my favourite place. Having said that, I love playing in India and we've built up such a rivalry with the Border Gavaskar Trophy now that it almost is on par with Australia versus uh, England. But at the end of the day, I love playing in every country because um, it was an opportunity to get to know people and cultures, um, to see the world. So cricket took me to many amazing places. So I feel luckily and privileged to have that opportunity. A uh, question here from Lee Watson. If you had never played cricket, what do you think you would have done with your life? Well, maybe after this photographic exhibition, maybe I would have been a photographer, but I didn't know that 30 years ago. I went to teacher's college for one and a half hours, realised I was in the wrong position um, and didn't really know why I was there. So I quit university after one and a half hours. My other love growing up was soccer or football, and I played for the Australian um, youth team in that, so maybe I would have been a soccer player, but I always had in mind that I was going to be a professional sportsman, so thankfully that played out okay. Uh, one from Adil Ali. Which Indian bowler was most difficult to face according to you? Uh, I'd have to say probably Harbhajan Singh because he totally dominated us in the 2001 series where he took 32 wickets in three tests and pretty much single-handedly won that series. Um, he was a guy we couldn't seem to get on top of and was a fantastic uh, competitor, always in your face. He probably played the Aussie way. Uh, Anil Kumble, another amazing spinner, took over 600 wickets. Um, and the modern-day um, Indian side have got some, a really good pace attack, which probably didn't happen in our day, but they've got probably the best bowling attack they've ever had. Uh, we've got three more questions here. Um, Mohit Chaudhry, what made you select India as a subject of your book? Well, I guess I've touched on that a bit, that is my relationship with India. I've been going there for 30 odd years, numerous trips, and for me there's no other place in the world that uh, embraces cricket as much as the Indian population. Um, and it doesn't matter which background you're from, it seems to be a common thread that they love cricket, they want to play cricket. Um, so for me it was a natural place to start this journey. Um, Dipik Bhattacharya, and that's a long name, I hope I've got that right. Any plans of coaching in upcoming days? Not really, because I, I enjoy the, more of the role of mentoring. I did that last year with the Australian cricket team with Justin Langer during the Ashes series. Um, I like being involved in the players behind the scenes, uh, giving them short shortcuts to success, um, giving them the, the roadmap to success that maybe I've learnt during my journey. But I haven't ruled out being a coach one day. Maybe uh, some IPL team might want me one, one time, I don't know, but um, it takes a huge commitment and you're on the road as much as you were as a player. So for me right now, it was more about focusing on business, charity and the family. Uh, one from Darshak Mehta. How can I buy the book and is there a limit? There's certainly not a limit, Darshak. If you want to buy many, many books, you can do that. Uh, you can buy the book from steveward.com.au um, and that's the place you can get it. I've self-published it. Um, so have a look. Um, I hope you enjoy the book. Um, it's been a passion of mine. I'm really proud of... Um, what you see behind me, that's a snapshot of the, the book. There's 220 photos, 10,000 words. And uh, for me, that was something I've always wanted to do. So 
thanks for your time today. Thanks for supporting me. Um, hopefully we can catch up sometime in the future. Thank you for the questions.